Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our roundtable discussion on the evolution to platforms for account-based ecosystem and mass in Europe. Our discussion today is hosted by Global Mass Transit in association with Cubic. And as uh, Namrata said, I'm Bonnie Crawford. I head up the platforms business unit at Cubic and I'll be the moderator for our discussion today. I'm joined by a fantastic group of thought leaders from around the industry. I'm looking forward to a really interesting discussion. So if all of you that have uh, joined us from all over the world can join me in welcoming our panelists and, uh, and roundtable uh, uh, team today. We've got Suzanne Hoadley. Suzanne is the Senior Manager and Traffic Efficiency Coordinator from Polis. We have Boyd Cohen, the CEO for IOMOB, Carme Fabregas from, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher uh, my uh, pronunciation, but the Autoritat del Transport Metropolita uh, in Barcelona, the CTO and innovation leader there. Uh, and finally, Jeremy Goldberg, the worldwide director of critical infrastructure with Microsoft. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Just to really set the scene for the discussion that we're going to have. Um, uh, unlike perhaps other presentations, we're not going to be doing slides. We really want to have an interactive dialogue about the challenges that cities all over the world are facing as we transform mobility services. Uh, to set the scene, certainly the traditional pressures that we're all seeing um, as we work to build healthier cities that are focused on changing demographics and net zero, um, really driving the, um, the work that the global mass community um, have done and the entrance that we see with commercial private mobility services, and, and then of course the impacts um, of the pandemic, which we all are experiencing in our own way um, as we gather from around the world. And I'm, I'm watching the chat here from uh, people joining from uh, as far away as South Africa and uh, many that um, are in Amsterdam and um, it, it, you know, with Carme in, uh, in Spain and others uh, coming from um, all over the US where uh, for those on the West Coast uh, with me, it's still quite early in the morning. As we really uh, start today, I'd like to think about um, the, the question of how to manage this transformation that our industry um, is going. And as uh, the team that we've got uh, to discuss today, uh, as we met in advance, we thought one of the best ways to, to begin is to really agree on some principles and to really um, lay out some of the things that we all um, are facing. And, and a few that we came up with are certainly the, um, the budgets and the fact that mobility solutions are becoming increasingly sophisticated with the blend of the public and private options and how we work together to make those solutions borderless. Um, so my first uh, question, the topic that I think we'll use to kick this off is um, from the panel, are there transformation principles that you think are relevant to where we're going as, a, um, as an industry and as a society as it relates to mobility as a service? And um, this is a dialogue, so everybody uh, feel free to come off mute and, uh, and um, we'll start. Well, I... I, 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 I <laughs> Thank you very much, Bowen. I'd like to start with uh, a principle that for me is very fundamental and, uh, and which is very shortly uh, that digital transformation is not a goal in itself, but a way to pursue a, a goal. So in, in, if we take this into the, the mobility or the public transport sector, I think this is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable start uh, to, to, to initiate our conversation. Love that. That, that is a hundred percent true. Jeremy, 
<laughs> yeah, and thank you, Bonnie, and thank you to the team at Cubic, obviously, for inviting me. And, and, and you know, obviously, you're one of our most important uh, mobility and transportation partners uh, across the globe in our, in our ecosystem. Uh, you know, as a former public servant, uh, I joined Microsoft in January earlier this year after eight years of working in three cities and a state government. But most of all, I'm, I'm an urbanist uh, and someone who has worked and lived in some of these great cities. And I really believe in terms of principles, you know, thinking of mobility and transportation, frankly, in, in some of the most general terms possible, right? It includes everything from personal cars and public transportation to taxis, ride sharing, bikes and scooters, as we all know. But I think the, you know, the first opportunity that we have, right, is not only to improve all of these modes individually, but again, that point around the seamless integration and, and digital transformation piece. So as I see it, you know, five elements really of transforming, you know, our, our, our systems and our, it's our digital infrastructure, right? Sustainability, data and partnerships that really have equity as the foundational level, level that improve the resident experience. Absolutely. Boyd, you look like you're ready to jump in there. <laughs> uh, well, I was, but they took all the wind out of my sails. No, I would say um, I would, I would uh, compliment with two key fundamental uh, principles, I think. Uh, one is citizen-centric, um, thinking about how can we improve the quality of life for citizens should be driving uh, how we think about um, uniting the ecosystem. And that ties into the second one. I think uh, a theme around openness is really important. Um, open data, open transit, um, open systems, interoperable systems. And I think we're going to talk about some of those things today as well. But for me, you know, there's a lot of discussion or dispute um, around how to move this forward. And some push for more of a walled garden model, and some are starting to more proactively advocate for an open interoperable model, and I'm of the latter. Boyd, no one took the wind out of your sails. It, 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 transparency, it's, you said it best. I mean, trust, right, at the end of the day here. That's a lot of what we're talking about. It really does. And, and Suzanne, I think that's probably a topic that you um, have quite a bit of experience with in, in your work with Polis. What, what principles would you want to add or, or build on to from that? I agree with most of them. I mean, I really like Carmé's opening statement that, you know, the digital transition is not a goal, it's a means to an end. And, you know, supporting what Jeremy and Boyd said, we want sustainable and equitable cities sustainable and equitable transport systems that's the only goal and where digitalization can support that great uh, but uh you know i work a lot you know in, in my job i monitor uh, the whole sort of digital transition and support uh the police members which are sitting regional authorities uh on you know with that digital transition by providing this space for them to to share experiences and uh, what we see is Digital transition can be positive, but if we look at the digital platform economy as a whole, uh, while it's citizen centric and it's delivering a great service to its citizens, there are some adverse effects. And that's where we see that the, the city authorities, public authorities generally have to come in to try and bring some order to this wild west that's being created by all these disruptive uh, uh, concepts and, and, and technologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think we need to, to, so I guess I would bring in the, the principle of, of maybe governance and that that's important, which could include regulation, but also policy, you know, putting everything in a policy framework. But another issue that hasn't been raised, I think, is skills. Um, so I agree with what Boyd said about openness and, you know, public authorities were, you know, already for 10 years or so, we've been supporting um, our members on this open data movement. You know, we started working on it way back in 2010 with lots of the cities in, in Europe. So they do support this transparency. And of course they are, they are citizen centric and um, where digital digitalization can support that, great, um, but you need the budget and you need the skills as well. And that's something that we see is, is lacking in local authorities, especially the small ones, you know, they're transport managers, not not data managers and, you know, not digital people, although that is changing gradually. I think that's a really great point. And, and, and you know, especially when you think about the, 
the users and the fact that you're trying to govern users, just looking at the people that are joining us today, they're, they're, you know, crossing state and country boundaries, they're coming from rural and major urban centers. Um, you, you certainly live and represent a, a very large European urban center uh, there. Carme, did you want to add? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, and, and happy to, to, to add uh, something to what uh, uh, Suzanne just uh, came to say. I, I think that uh, we all should take, uh, we, we all uh, uh, agree on, uh, on, on, on the, the opportunities that technology brings uh, uh, to all of us in our daily basis uh, uh, life. But, uh, but uh, taking a step back uh, and to complement what Suzanne uh, just uh, came to say, I, I would, I would uh, search for your agreement on, on that uh, very few have really a crystal clear vision uh, or destination uh, that, uh, that the entire sector is following at this moment. And, uh, and considering uh, if there's no uh, destination, each business or each uh, PTO, or each PTA or each, uh, each uh, private uh, uh, service provider is, is making up uh, its, own, its own vision, its own version. And, uh, and, uh, and the entire ecosystem is uh, prone to become fragmented and disjoined. I think uh, at, at last uh, we have to, to take uh, this very much into account and see where and what things have to be or what pieces have to be uh, put in place beyond what technologies and beyond uh, what interfaces or what uh, um, procedures we are to following to 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 find this goal uh, to reach this goal. That, that, I think that's a really good point, and it actually leads us into one of the topics that, as a group, we um, identified. You know, for the conversation to go to as we think about that interoperability and about the the fact that I think Suzanne. Um, really wisely pointed out, we have so many of our um, you know, managing authorities and whether they're coming from um, a very dense urban uh, center or they may come from one of the, um, the smaller agencies throughout the world, finding that skill and finding the, um, the awareness for something that can be so complex, whether it's the account-based ticketing or it's the interoperability of the service providers from the micro-mobility and ride sharing to the buses and trains and, uh, and bicycles that are um, you know, populating uh, all over the world. How can we use those tools um, to really promote the interoperability. And I think perhaps maybe Jeremy um, will start with you on that evolution um, that technology uh, can, can start to drive um, as we create that interoperable ecosystem. Sure. Yeah, the great points. And I really love the part on skilling and workforce development and training and the capacity side of this. And so there are a lot of challenges you know, when creating this sort of you know, common platform, let's say, between like what pu public and private sector leaders uh, can do and approach them together. And, you know, I, I really, you know, look at it as, you know, the existing, you know, systems, right, that we've, we have have grown over the course of, you know, a century now. And that means that we are building, right, this next generation of transit and mobility in a, um, let's call it like a physical and regulatory environment to the governance point that was created for many different historical moments, uh, various points in time. And so one of the main challenges is really finding a way to build on top of and within that system while making that leap forward in efficiency right, and effectiveness. So of course, we're gonna have to have a strong base of technology in place to collect data from a wide variety of, of sources, you know, analyze and proactively use it, and you know, really, in a sense, I think it's easier to imagine that mature state of a common you know, mobility platform than it is to chart the path to realizing it, right? That's the point. So how do we do that? Um, we need to prioritize flexibility. 
uh, in the platforms and solving concrete, immediate day-to-day -day problems. And so getting to that mature mobility platform is really going to mean implementing solutions to, to the sort of acute problems along the way that can be built upon and integrated with other systems over time. So I think it's, it also means you know, taking compliance seriously and building a platform that can adapt to those changing um, regulations, as I mentioned, those different historical moments, especially around sustainability. Um, and, but of course, it's, it's in other categories around data privacy and, and cybersecurity. Great points. You have a lot of agreement coming from the chat uh, as well, Jeremy. And it's nice to know that the experts, more than I am, <laughs> nod their heads on those things. Well, I, I think that that perhaps leads um, to an interesting question that Suzanne, you know, as the um, the, one of the world leading bodies that's focusing on the policy side and uh, on creating that network of um, advisory and, and oversight. What, um, at, you know, as you think about what Polis has been focusing on, I know that there was a, um, a governance discussion and Jeremy highlighted that, you know, data governance is so important. Can you talk to us a little bit about the work that's been done to start to establish some of those data governance um, provisions and how you're working with the uh, members around the European um, uh, continent to get uh, that governance in, in place? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, though, it's more than data governance. I think that's a big part of it. But I think it's just the relationships uh, between the public and, and the private sector, how they're going to work together moving forward. So, of course, yeah, we've done a lot of work on that within within polis, within different working groups. Uh, we have one working group that's really dealing with governance um, in relation to, to micromobility providers. I work more on the, the digital uh, platform side, I guess. But so, so we, within Polis, what we do is, um, you, well, you mentioned uh, the work we're doing. Uh, we, we've been monitoring maths for, for many years now. It's one of our jobs to, to monitor developments in the mobility space and to understand, to ascertain how uh, our members can benefit from them, what could the implications be on the wider mobility system, so MASS is one of those. And already back in 2017, we issued a, a, a paper where we first had a discussion with our members, you know, what do you understand by MASS, what does it mean for you, where do you see opportunity, where do you see disbenefit, and, and that was brought together in, in, a, in a sort of a discussion paper. Uh, and then earlier this year, we also um, issued another paper that we did jointly with UITP and EMTA, so two public transport bodies, I uh, guess UITP, a, a global body that's well known, and EMTA, which is an association of European passenger transport authorities, and I know that Kame is a, an active member within, within, this net, within this network. And yeah, I guess core, you know, this paper, puts forward a number of principles and recommendations, about eight or nine, and I think half of them were really related to governance, you know, going forward, the governance of this mass ecosystem, because we are expecting, you know, Europe, the European Union is building policy on, on mobility as a service, or what it now calls multimodal digital mobility services. So, in the future, we could potentially see legislation um, that's maybe building on, you know, the Finnish uh, 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 legislative, uh, uh, well, Finnish legislation or French legislation. Again, uh, we've seen these national legislations which are uh, allowing the, the resale of public transport tickets, of mobility uh, services more generally. And if we know that there has been some, some pressure on European Commission to have, uh, you know, a European uh, approach, um, a European initiative. So that's why Polis came together with UIPTP and, and, and EMTA to produce this paper uh, where we set out sort of our vision of what mass is and why it's important for it to be governed by public authorities at the local or the regional level, whether that's a PTA or, or, or a local authority, so that we can steer the implementation of mass in the right direction towards those goals that we mentioned before because you know we always you know, we often hear that mass is supporting sustainable mobility but 
in mass like any other digital platform it's the way it's implemented it's the policy framework that surrounds that it's the, the regulations that could be in place or the rules or the codes of conduct whatever you like that will really determine to what extent it can support those those policy goals um so that's why we we, we issued the paper and uh, you know the conversation with european commission and other stakeholders will will continue in in, in the coming years um yeah some really great points and definitely a lot to unpack there. One of the things that um, I'd really love to um, to hear, um, Carme, just thinking about what Suzanne was um, was speaking around the the fact that there's so many facets to mobility as a service, and in in so many different areas, it means something different, um, and how it's implemented from a technology perspective, from a governance perspective, um, a, across a lot of different providers. Everyone is wanting to be in the mobility as a service business or or uh, service, if you will, um, especially if we think of this uh, as a, a service to riders and, and you know, from a sustainability perspective. What are you seeing um, in your work in Barcelona um, as it relates to this? Um, thank you for, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in Barcelona, we, we made uh, our leap very, very, uh, uh, happily let's say and 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 uh, we did we did uh, our uh, integration full integration of uh, of the ticketing system and the fare management system uh, which means that all the operators share the same system and share the same tickets for them to be able to uh, to uh, uh, pose a, a, a unique a unique uh, network before before the customer uh, our travelers in Barcelona and the and the whole area, which is uh, which is quite a dynamic area, uh, made up by by the bus and, and metro operators of, of the city of Barcelona, railway operators, um, suburban buses, etc. We are managing in a region that uh, that uh, the place of uh, more than uh, five. Uh, uh, five million people, and uh, we did uh, we did um, uh, reach our our goal, uh, and it was the result of a very full commitment of of the the whole ecosystem. We 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 were only the orchestrators of this uh, of this goal to be to be reached, and uh, it was the result of uh, of the generosity of uh, of all the stakeholders coming together. Uh, to fulfill uh, a unique goal, we've been uh, really refer referenced uh, as a, as a, as an example to follow, and now we are very much committed to go a step further in in terms of embracing this new kind of mobility, which is uh, which is participated or which uh, will be have to be participated uh, by other service providers coming from the private, because uh, we are questioning ourselves what the concept of public transport is. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a question that all of us should be, uh, should be making ourselves because uh, what, what public transport is and uh, what uh, this common goal uh, in regard of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the green agenda or the, or the, the objective or common or let's say uh, the, the, the whole picture is about in the coming years. I think we all uh, agree that uh, our, our goal is to be able to offer the customer or the traveler uh, uh, the means and the attractiveness to leave their car, the private car at home and be able to uh, make uh, the mobility decision to be them uh, on on a work uh, on a workday basis or in a, in holiday patterns or different patterns to be able for them to to use uh, sustainable uh, mode of uh, transport modes uh, be them uh, public transport and uh, and uh, and served by by private stakeholders in a in a 
in a very easy, in a very uh, sharp and uh, and a very instant uh, means of 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 managing. And uh, that said, I think uh, we we should uh, take our attention to uh, at the, at the, at, the, at two facts. One uh, one the, the very the very one of the very important facts that I'd like to highlight uh, at this moment is that uh, public transport has done uh, a lot in the, in these recent years in in terms of uh, of uh, um, offering uh, real uh, and good infrastructures and uh, and uh, um, they uh, public transport has shaped uh, the modern cities as we enjoy. Uh, them ourselves. It's, uh, it's a very differentiating uh, aspect uh, uh, that uh, that we are happy to to uh, to enjoy. And and secondly, uh, we have to build on on this. We have to build on this, and we have uh, uh, to see that uh, we come from very distant positions when we come when we speak about public and private partners coming together. And, uh, and this is a fact also to be taken into account uh, alongside with the, the, the momentum that public transport has in embracing and, and, and going down the path of digitalization. But this velocity is not the same as, uh, as the one coming from uh, private stakeholders that have no wasted um, uh, um, items to 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 protect. So, uh, in this regard, we have to avoid the trap of of seeing only uh, differences and uh, and and see what uh, what uh, are the common points that we all would agree on, and uh, and uh, over over um, overcome the the resistances that are not uh, always. The result of intentional desires to to throw uh, efforts, but uh, the impossibility or the the lacking of agility that uh, public transport should have uh, at um, at coming together with uh, with uh, private in 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 some aspects. I think that's a a really good um, a really good observation when when you think about the the public and private providers and the fact that public transit is the backbone of you know every um, every major city and and yet we have all of these different mobility service providers that are coming in I'm you know watching some of the discussion happening in the chat whether it's ride sharing or hailing or you know bikes and scooters and um, a, a question for Boyd, You've been working with so many of these mobility service providers to create that interoperability. What are some of the challenges um, that you've faced as you try to bring public transit uh, and those other um, service providers together into a single ecosystem and creating that, um, that collaboration? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a couple of things that Suzanne and Karma both said resonate with me as well, relating to this point around the, the blurring of lines potentially between public and private. And I think, you know, there's this, I, I, it's, a, it's very common in Moss to have these, what I consider false dichotomies, that everything is black or white, everything is public or private. It's a private, it's a B2B app or it's a B2C app. Um, the transit agency is the driver or they're just a participant. Uh, but there's a lot of gray in here. And I think this comment around the role of micromobility in Moss and public transit and what is public transit going for? I mean, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't think about maybe 15 years ago, we didn't think about public transit agencies hosting bike share systems. Well, they do now. They sponsor them, they launch them, they subsidize them, they do something. Well. And, and we've also heard references to account-based ticketing a few times in this uh, webinar already, and we'll probably hear more about it. When you think about, you know, I think it was Jeremy said, it's kind of easier to see the end goal here. For me, uh, it's critical that services like micromobility be uh, enabled, connected to public transit, and even often subsidized, and not just the type of public bike share system, 
But if you think about an account-based ticketing system that encourages nudging towards more sustainable behavior, and most of us on this call, I think, uh, are aspired to cities that are less car dependent. To get to less car dependent, we need to actually create a user experience that is as good or better than taking your car from door to door. That combines regulation like regulating out parking spaces so it's even more expensive and costly to drive and road user charging probably, but it also includes things, nudging behaviors that we can offer from the transit agency and other actors, even private ones, to encourage people to get out of their car and take seamless door-to-door -door journeys. Well, seamless door-to-door, -door, more sustainable journeys are often gonna involve micromobility as part of a public transit journey, great. Well, if we wanna make that happen, then why can't account-based ticketing be applied beyond core classical public transit services and extended to micromobility? Well, to do that, you have to integrate micromobility seamlessly into journey planning and have relationships between the suppliers and the transit agency and have the rules and the governance system in place to, mo to mo um, manage that. And you know, there's a lot of complexities around micromobility for first and last mile. When you talk about journey planning, we, we're tackling this challenge at IMOB head on and it's really complicated. You have geofencing, you have docking stations that may or may not be, have any availability when the user gets to their destination. You have micromobility that's not reservable in advance. So when a user is gonna take a longer journey of like 30, 45 minutes, how do you guarantee there is some micromobility device available to them at the end of their journey? And for some people that might be a critical decision point before they decide to leave their car in the garage. My point being, there is a whole lot of complexity when you, un when you take the hood off and you really start thinking about what does a true sustainable MOS ecosystem look like that seamlessly been, blends public and private services, all in the goal of improving citizen quality of life and, and uh, more sustainable mobility patterns in our city. So a lot to take on uh, and we won't solve it all today, but I'm looking forward to, to working with all of you on that challenge. Can I, I see put it. in there? Go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah. yeah, can I ask a question to Boyd then? So, so you're, for you, the mass is more than just uh, integration at the digital level. I mean, it, it, it's more than that. It's also uh, the actual, the physical delivery of those services and the physical integration of, of those services. For sure. Is that correct? It's like a, yeah, it's, it's an ecosystem. It's, uh, it's about relationships between the actors. Uh, it's the human experience of how do you actually encourage, support, and make easy for people to actually go from different modes and also, again, the payment systems, the nudging systems that involve uh, sort of psychology, behavioral science, and all the rest. So yeah, there's a, it, it's, there's a lot to unpack. There may be, you know, there, there are a few things here, and I was looking for the thumbs up or the clap, you know, emojis here uh, on Zoom, but I'm, I can locate them on Teams far easier. So I apologize, I wasn't able to do that during Suzanne and, and Boyd's comments. Um, but, you know, Suzanne mentioned something around, you know, less around governance uh, earlier on and more around the relationships. And Boyd was talking about at the start around the user-centric nature of these things. So, you know, from starting from the kind of resident impact or user centric piece here, you know, I think overall, in order to get to that relationship that's really effective in this conversation, we understand or we need to do better in understanding that, you know, residents, people, right, we're talking about prize convenience, right, over almost everything else, this is my opinion, when it comes to their mobility and transit options. And, and despite the fact that many of the places that we all may prefer to live are places where we'd see, like to see fewer cars on the roads, personal cars have often been the most convenient option for people because, you know, they leave and they, and when you leave and they go exactly where you want to go. And if our transit systems are to achieve these goals, they need to compete based on convenience. So on the partnership and relationship side piece, I believe that successful partnerships and dialogue between public and private are going to require that constant communication and the willingness to really sustain those relationships beyond political administration and changes in leadership because companies, Microsoft and others, will have to stay open to those changing environments. And the payoff, I believe in terms of this integration 
will lead to that more resilient, critical infrastructure, digital and physical, that can stand the test of time and ultimately lead to a better resident people-centric experience in a city. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because one of the questions and, and in addition to the interesting dialogue that's happening in our um, in our chat with uh, people sharing information, we have a number of questions that have also come in for um, our team of uh, extremely um, intelligent, uh, you know, thought leaders around mobility as a service. And um, to your point, Jeremy, I think building on the discussion about the physical and the digital, uh, Bharat uh, Pathanya has, um, has, has said, you know, one of the challenges for account-based ticketing is all of the multi-hardware and PSP arrangements and a, an ideal world is a, a rider can just use their contactless bank card to tap and go uh, with the back office suggesting best value fare. Operators have already invested heavily into the kit and back office arrangements. Uh, this is certainly the case for other mass modes without additional hardware um, to any uh, without adding additional hardware to a transport fleet um, and leveraging the existing hardware, how can we integrate to um, and, and build a more centralized and interoperable um, technical solution? And is there a local authority that has perhaps solved um, that challenge? So I'll open it up to the, the panel for um, some answers there. I'll take a stat, a quick, go, go ahead, Carmen, go ahead. I'll, I'll... Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Well, uh, to start with uh, this, uh, this excellent topic, I think uh, we should uh, be aware that uh, uh, from the, the Europe uh, Commission perspective, there has been uh, an effort uh, to, to promote interoperability of the ticketing systems and make uh, uh, travelers uh, travel seamlessly ac uh, across borders. This is this is a fact, and uh, the directive that we are uh, referring in in, in this is uh, under revision now, uh, in order to uh, be uh, updated to the new realities. This is this is one fact. Another fact uh, I I uh, highlight is that uh, I think um, yeah, from a from a global uh, standpoint, uh, we all would agree that uh, moving forward to uh, to an account-based system, be it uh, ticketing uh, or transport-based or uh, payment-based, is uh, a, a good option uh, for um, easing up uh, this integration with other uh, mobility partners to uh, to to complement. Uh, the, the public transport services. In this in this regard, uh, I, I belong to a, to a, an association which is the Smart Ticketing Alliance, uh, which is uh, focused along with uh, the UITP, which is focused to um, to set the path towards an interoperable uh, account-based system uh, fashion of of of, uh, of developing in order to. Uh, try to avoid fragmentation and try to uh, avoid uh, this disjoint of, uh, of uh, local uh, mobility system uh, services in regard of ticketing and in regard of um, accessing the, the, the transport. This is, uh, this is uh, for me, is, uh, is a goal to be, to be reached. I don't know exactly how, but uh, I think we, we all uh, should be committed to, to that. Uh, from our own skills and from um, our own um, positions. You know, that's a, re a really great point. And um, certainly at as Cubic, as the a technology provider that is, you know, collaborating across um, cities all over the world, I think that that, that platform aspect of this and the, the focus on creating a subscription um, ecosystem that you can, um, you can have hardware from different providers, you can even have exactly. a back office from different providers, but by really moving to that 
um, that operating model that that agencies can buy into um, that allows that interoperability and creates that open um, that open framework. And it's certainly um, something that uh, we're, we're heavily focused on um, as uh, as part of what we're doing on the UMO platform side um, here at Cubic. We have a few other questions um, and a lot of discussion. So I'm going to keep um, moving here. One of the, um, the things that has come up is uh, when we discuss, and, and Carme, you just started to talk about account-based ticketing, um, what are we actually defining? Are you um, talking about the media that's being used? Um, and, uh, and how do we think about account ID sharing and that back office interoperability? Um, and perhaps uh, we'll start um, with Jeremy on uh, on some of the the back office side, and and then over to uh, the the rest of the panel. Well, in in uh, in a few lines, uh, uh, is uh, account based ticketing is about uh, taking the front of the front end uh, logical that uh, that validators or that uh, other engines uh, uh, <clears throat> develop. Uh, and that uh, respond to very complicated or very local uh, based uh, fair products, let's say tickets, and uh, and it's uh, it's moved to the back end in in order to uh, to see that uh, uh, the the management of, of of the fair products are able to be uh, or are enabled. To be managed as uh, as uh, uh, in a very in, in much more simpler way uh, by by allowing the the the, the let's say the, vali the the validators or the or the management of the system be uh, be fulfilled by by backend uh, by backend uh, processes. In this in this regard, uh, it uh, it takes. Uh, into into consideration that uh, each customer has an account uh, and uh, this account can be participated with several uh, several service providers and uh, it implies that uh, that uh, the, the the participants can be much more dynamic and uh, and that uh, technology is much simpler and uh, and uh, there are also challenges and risks to be to be to be fulfilled, of course. But uh, it seems a more agile way to uh, develop new fair products, which uh, can uh, fill in with uh, with the uh, personal um, necessities that uh, that the customer can take, which is uh, which is a result of uh, of the digital transformation of public transport and and move from very legacy. Uh, driven systems into a more open and more uh, standardized uh, ways of managing and much more uh, easy to uh, to be participated uh, by different stakeholders be them public or, or private so take uh, take the front end into the back end and uh, and uh, with much more uh, relationships between back ends and not uh, and escaping from uh, from legacy systems that uh, prevent for uh, um, from uh, interoperable um, mobility change to 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 be put in place. Jeremy and Boyd, you both look like you have. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying this. this. Is a great chat. One of I mean, I've been on several webinars lately. This. This one really is the, the, the crown jewel, the comments here and the questions, I'm trying not to get lost in them. So uh, a couple points, and I, and I, and I really uh, agree quite well, as much with the reliability, predictability, and the affordability side of this in terms of transportation options and also safety, right? That, we're, we're, that is the critical piece here. So, um, so I wanna kind of respond to some of that and then and think about the back office pieces. So. Um, so I think we all can agree, we all know, right, data, the data piece is all core, 
at the core, you know, of why common platforms are so important. And nearly everyone understands the value of the data at this point. Now, we've still only begun to scratch the surface uh, of the value in the mobility and transit space. So municipal transit authorities, right, they're managed by multiple agencies and each has their own policies and systems to Carmi's point around legacy, for example, or business processes. So a lot of these things are not yet digitalized, right, on the back end. Maybe a form is digitized, but that doesn't really solve the problem. So each has their own system. And in order to realize a unified transit system, those barriers have to be broken down. And making decisions and investments in isolation in those places may solve some specific acute problems, but can leave the place larger with larger systematic problems. So like equitable access or unsustainable system-wide costs. And so the success of these systems is how well people are able to move around, right? To that reliability, convenience, safety, and affordability piece. So it sounds obvious, but each choice about, you know, how to collect and use our data along the way should be moving towards that end. And that means using the data to identify more effective schedules of public transit, understanding, you know, best where taxis and individual mobility can fill the gaps, and of course, be cost effective. So it's really about making real choices about how to invest in and deploy those options based on the data and in the information. And so all data, final point here, and I'll, I'll stop, is has to be considered and analyzed in this regular discussion within our communities and with people. And that's hard to do, uh, but it is a necessity because if we're not coming at it from that individual, personal, kind of people-centric place, uh, we're getting more of the same. So two, two really interesting things that you bring up there around the data and, and that align to two of the questions that we've had in the Q&A. We've talked about the data aspect, but how are you managing issues related to GDPR and the PII um, that's coming with that user data? So as a user, you're perhaps hopping between a journey planning experience, a back office, um, you know, account-based ticketing uh, account that you may have, and then perhaps accounts that relate to the bike share or the scooter provider or the uh, the car sharing. So, you know, perhaps Boyd, um, we haven't uh, had um, you give us a, a, an insight in a couple of minutes here. You know, how are you handling that, um, the privacy and the, um, and the data around uh, users? Yeah, this is a topic that, of course, in Moss and pretty much any 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 discussion around platforms and data sharing about users becomes very prevalent, especially in the European context. I am all that in particular is a middleware platform, and whenever possible, we actually try not to own the user data and own the user at all. Uh, our clients tend to be public and private actors who already have some rights to the user data, and we prefer to deflect that and let them continue to own that user data. I don't like the, the way a lot of, it's more common in the private sector, this concept of, well, we need to own the user. You know, a lot of the venture backed uh, tech startups in the transport space want to own the user and own the user data. I feel like that's a bit of a flawed approach because nobody owns the user. We're people who are not owned by anyone and our data, we should have rights to, expose our data or let organizations share that data when it's appropriate and beneficial to us. And that's where I think this account-based ticketing discussion again, and, and, and I feel like account-based ticketing is a way underexplored um, element of the big end state goal of, of MOSS and mobility in general. Uh, there's so much power behind what ABT could enable, but to enable that power, a, a user or resident has to be willing to let go of some of the privacy in for their own benefit. I mean, an example of ABT uh, use case is, right, like students or lower income people or elderly who could have special privileges accessing the mobility ecosystem through a MOS platform, including any private service that's connected to the platform. Well, think about somebody who's maybe disabled, um, or limited abilities of movement in some way. 
And why couldn't you have a transit system so resilient and so equitable that it says that when a when user has limited mobility, they should be the, have the right to move in the city for a similar cost as able-bodied people do. And if that means part of their journey needs to be done in a private taxi that's uh, um, uh, wheelchair enabled, why should they have to pay more for that? Well, probably all of us on this call agree with that, but how do you execute that if nobody knows the user and nobody knows if they're eligible for this benefit or not? So I do think we're gonna have to manage this challenge and, and support uh, positive data sharing rather than, the problem is GDPR exists for a really good reason that companies have a tendency to uh, exploit data about individual users to sell them extra products they may or may not want and try to monetize in different ways. But we're missing the point that better knowledge of people's travel behavior or desires or personal situations could actually enable that equitable transportation ecosystem that we're talking about. So there, there's still some heavy lifting to be done on this one. I could come in here, but then aren't we just, I mean, you mentioned that um, you don't like, you think it's a flaw that uh, the operator owns the customer's data. But if we move to a mass model, surely it would then be the intermediary, the mass provider that then owns the data. So then we need to think about, you know, data sharing mechanisms and principles as well. Um, because, um, you know, if, if, if a, a user is using your transport service, whether it's an e-scooter or a bus or a metro or a car sharing service, then you're entitled to, 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 to receive some data about that. And should you be paying for that? Because that's certainly one of the, 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 the issues that we discussed within the policy UATP and EMTA paper. You know, public transport uh, operators, they get a lot of information about the way users use their network and that's used to inform planning, uh, transport planning, the way the network is planned for the benefit of the users. And, and in future, there's a concern that um, not only could this data be found in servers uh, or held by companies the other side of the world, but they, it would be very difficult to access that data. And, and just the other week, I just want to make a quick plug for um, an initiative that uh, I was very briefly introduced to, and it's called the Fair's Fair um, Data Sharing um, Principles. I think they've been discussed within the Mass Alliance, but that looks quite interesting because it brings some transparency there, and there is this data sharing between the different stakeholders, um, even if it doesn't get into the, you know, the, the, the commercial uh, aspect. Quick, quick comment. I think we're going to see um, standards around data sharing in urban and, and regional areas uh, in MOS ecosystems where different stakeholders are given, given differential access to anonymized and aggregated data. So if I'm a micro mobility operator and I am in, I have exposed my API so that my services can be part of a MOS platform. I have a right as the operator to have aggregate anonymized data about how micromobility services, not just my own, are being used in the city, where there are gaps in the market, all the rest of it. As an example, the transit agency, whether they operate the MOS platform or they're an orchestrator, maybe they have uh, rights to aggregate anonymized data of all the journey behavior of, of the whole system. Um, Users might be able to opt in or out of how much data can be shared in this platform. This could be blockchain enabled. You could have a consortium blockchain model. We've looked at that. In fact, we're doing a Horizon 2020 project in that space right now. Um, so my short answer is I fully agree. There needs to be a level of, of data sharing. And I think any actor who's participating in the MOS ecosystem should have some level of access but that level doesn't have to be the same for everyone. This, the transit agency probably has, should have more rights to more data than say a, a private operator of one mode of mobility in the ecosystem. Yeah, Boyd, that's a really great point as you think about that collaboration between the parties, uh, the, the cities that are you know, creating some of this governance, the mobility um, authorities and the transit agencies that are, of course, driving the vast majority of the 
um, of the public transport services and then all of the different private operators that have a important role to play to create that environment for the rider because ultimately as we think about mobility as a service and certainly the chat and and many of the questions have indicated this no one ultimately owns the rider but the rider is uh, at the center of making the choices about which modes to take and what gets people out of their single occupancy vehicle and into that mobility as a service ecosystem i do want to be mindful of time because it feels like this is going to be just part one of a um a, of continuing conversation we have uh, dozens of uh, questions, both in the chat and um, and as well in uh, um, in the Q and A. We will uh, put out the answers to the Q and A. Um, but I just like to um, ask each of our participants um, on the panel today, you know, one uh, final thought around um, the mobility as a service ecosystem and uh, and the platform uh, technology that underpins it. If you could um, leave each of our uh, participants with one key takeaway, and we'll start with Suzanne. Oh, and you're on mute. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, um, I needed time to think there. You know, I, I, I'm, I would really like to understand and to, the, the problem that we are trying to solve with mobility as a service. And I'm afraid I don't accept getting people out of their cars uh, is enough. It's a, it's a too simplistic argument. You know, cities have been uh, doing this for years with some success. Uh, earlier we were talking about the convenience, Jeremy was talking about, you know, what's the main thing that determines your mode choice and that's convenience, that's why we select the car. Well, in European city centres it's inconvenient to, to, to ride, to take your car. And so most people are, don't use a car, don't even own a car. You know, the big problem we have in European cities is commuting traffic. So, you know, so how is mass addressing that, you know? And so, yeah, I really want to have a better understanding and I would like to see some more data about uh, you know changes in travel behavior because we just assume it's going to impact uh, or you know people are going to change the way they travel but we know it's not so simple there's a whole body of science about uh, a travel behavior and um, I'm not sure that uh, a mass service um, is enough. You need other things, the carrots and the sticks, the push and pull measures that, that we mentioned. That's just part of, you know, mass is just one part of the uh, the, the mix. Um, but there are many other things that are needed as well. I think that was there's quite long. Be... Sorry, sorry. Oh no, that's per that's perfect because you at least you set up a, a continued discussion. I'm sure about uh, the the carrots and sticks that we can uh, we can employ. Jeremy, I'll pass it over to you for your final thoughts. Sure, and thanks again for including me today. I've learned a lot uh, as well here. So, um, you know, I think that what, what's top of mind for me are two things. Um, you know, one takeaway is, you know, it's important to realize, right, that people don't typically make distinctions about who is running a particular mode of transportation and who is managing the roads, who provides a taxi service or running the metro system. It's not something I think that most people spend that much time thinking about. So, what are we doing and how can we better show results from these partnerships and the work that we're doing and showing them, I think, earlier and often. Um, most, many of the different, you know, one of the challenges I've seen this from my work in cities is, you know, one of the major difficulties is really uh, of those partnerships is maintaining kind of strong public support and, you know, resident sentiment. And so uh, we need to get better at measuring and communicating, I think, the, the positive impact as we go forward in terms of what it is that we're doing. Um, that could be across a number of different, I think, metrics. Because um, remember to that point, right, infrastructure, the, the platforms, the things that we're talking about here are often, I think, invisible when it's working well. And so that means people might not really see the benefit, even if they're experiencing it. So we need to go, I think, out of our way to really communicate and connect with people to show these results and continuously kind of build upon and improve um, the, the system that we, we aspire for. Excellent point. 
we'll take it over to you, Carme, and then uh, move quickly over to Boyd for final thoughts. Well, uh, just uh, just to be uh, quick, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, be very much aware that digital transformation is about uh, changing culture. Uh, our our we are all uh, very much uh, agreeing that we are we don't like uh, unfamiliar patterns, and uh, we should agree on that uh, public transport uh, goals. Uh, which include uh, not be commercially led, uh, be inclusive, and etc., are not uh, are not rezoning reason uh, in 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 private companies which are much more familiar with uh, with uh, commercial and with financing and uh, and another aspect which is that uh, many uh, want to create their own ecosystem and not. Uh, participating in someone else's so it's uh, it's about of uh, of maturity it's about of uh, this digital um, change and that uh, covid uh, will bring us to a next level very very undeniable excellent boyd final thoughts yeah uh, hard to hard to add anything to everything already said but uh, i would just say that i think um We've only started the Moss journey, and I think people have this assumption that we know what Moss is and that it's a very urban, transit-centric, multimodal solution. And I think what we're about to see, uh, as Suzanne said, there's going to be regulation in Europe around opening transit. I think we're going to see regulation requiring private operators to expose their APIs to aggregated platforms. So we're going to see... I believe, based on our own conversations with public and private actors, an explosion of models that nobody's even thinking about right now in how users will gain access to multimodal door-to-door -door journeys, and not just in urban areas, in rural areas, rural to suburban to urban, and even interurban, and even air to rail. We haven't talked about that, but there's this big trend around uh, eliminating short haul flights, especially in Europe, and moving to rail. And those are going to need journey planning and door to door experiences too. So, I think uh, we're we're just at the we're just getting started, and it's going to be an exciting journey over the next ten years to see a whole new type and and new generation of multimodal platforms emerging, supported by government. Um, enabled also by the private sector, and hopefully things like account-based ticketing will become much more uh, mainstream as well. I, I almost couldn't have summed it up uh, better myself, Boyd. That's a great, uh, a great way to end the discussion. It's, uh, it's so much more than just uh, an app that's focused only on the most urban uh, centers. Mobility as a service is an evolution and a, a great journey that we're all on together. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists. We had uh, probably one of the most engaging discussions both in the chat and, uh, and on uh, video um, that we've had. And thank you to Global Mass Transit for hosting our discussion today. Uh, we are very excited to continue the conversation and hope everyone will be able to join us for the next one. Serbi, I'll pass it back over to you. Thank Thanks, you so Bonnie, much. for moderating. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you much. So much Bonnie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Bonnie, and all the speaker panelists for joining and making the panel discussion so interactive. Thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.